Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from the Orthoclips podcast series, and today I'm with Dr. Joshua Pays, who's at the Shriners Hospital for Children, Philadelphia. He's an adjunct clinical associate professor of orthopedic surgery at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. And today our title of our podcast is Infection After Spine Surgery, Best Practices to Avoid It. Thanks, Josh, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's get into it. Um, how'd you get interested in the topic? Um, you obviously uh, are interested in it and uh, have a lot to say. Uh, how did you, uh, how did you get interested? Well, we actually had uh, Fred Sweet was a old Wash U fellow when I was there and he came and gave us a lecture about his use of uh, topical vancomycin as he had one of, I think the seminal papers that sort of uh, started a lot of this in the world of orthopedics. And that sort of got us thinking and, and interested in using it at uh, my fellowship at 10 years ago at Wash U. And then uh, more recently, I had to give a grand rounds at Penn. And rather than, you know, talking to them about uh, Cobb angles and, uh, you know, level selection, which we like to geek out a lot of here at the Triners, and it uh, would be more interesting for them uh, to look at sort of infection for uh, all uh, aspects of the subspecialties, or be much more interesting for a larger group. Uh, so we sort of wanted to look at infection prevention and what we're doing and reevaluating what we've been doing. Uh, are we doing it correctly? Is there evidence to support it? Or are we just been doing some anecdotal practices because that's what we're used to? Great, yeah, I think it's um, an important topic that definitely crosses over, um, you know, especially for those of us who uh, put in metal, essentially, you know, spine, joints, trauma are probably the big ones, but uh, pretty much crosses over all of orthopedics. So. If you had to summarize your top five tips, because it's such a multifactorial kind of thing. I mean, you think about like, you know, what does the patient need to do? What does the surgeon need to do? What is the OR setup should be? What kind of gloves you use, prep? I mean, there's so many things that go into this really um, kind of drapes to use everything. So what if you were to say your top five tips today, to inf avoid infection and spine surgery, knowing that there's so many things, what are the most important ones? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's certainly very multifactorial and that's the trouble. There's so many things involved. So uh, I think, you know, trying to distill it down to uh, what can you control, I think is what, how we try to look at it. Cause there's things you can control and there's some things you just can't. So what we try to look at is, you know, preoperative optimization. Can you optimize the patient prior to them getting in the OR? You know, a lot of times in the pediatric world, it's actually they're underweight, uh, especially in ours who has a, um, you know, uh, for sp the spinal deformity population, they can be uh, nutritionally depleted and that can actually be a trouble with uh, wound healing postoperatively. So we have a lot of nutritional optimization that we do prior to surgery uh, to try to get them in the best shape possible. If they're just too small now in the adult uh, world, when I was doing uh, adult spine surgery, it was usually the other end of things. So weight reduction. Uh, prior to surgery, I think is important. Um, but really just looking at any kind of factors, pre-existing factors the patients have that you might be able to mitigate, be it weight, uh, their glucose control, smoking, anything that you, do, you can do prior to surgery to put, get them in the best shape possible. Because a lot of our procedures are elective. Uh, and so what can you do in that setting to reduce their risk before they even get to the operating room? The next thing we do, number two, is probably our sort of a, a chlorhexidine scrub the night before. Uh, it's relatively low risk, uh, easy to do, inexpensive, uh, and is not, as I said, a, a low risk uh, type of procedure. The data out there is fairly strong that it does uh, sort of lend itself towards potentially reducing surgical site infections. Uh, some will say it may have less of a benefit for the low risk population, uh, but a, more, a, a better uh, um, efficacy in the sort of moderate to high risk patients of just having a chlorhexidine scrub the night before. But again, relatively easy to do relatively inexpensive and low risk. The third one is, uh, so now you got the patient in the OR, you know, just trying to make your, your OR as efficient as possible. Obviously the longer OR times, the lo longer time the, uh, the wound is exposed uh, that can be inoculated. Uh, so it has been, there's a lot of evidence to support that frequent uh, you know, uh, irrigation during the procedure and just trying to minimize OR time is, is, and blood loss is, is most efficacious. As far as intraoperative irrigation goes, I mean, you could, some studies say irrigate two liters every hour, which can sometimes be a bit oppressive. I don't think we're certainly doing it that often, but also should you irrigate with saline or potentially dilute betadine is out there? 
You know, 0.35 percent dilute betadine irrigation has been discussed widely as likely safe. It is off label. Um, it's not what it was indicated for, but relatively easily to prepare on the back table or with your uh, circulating nurse. As long as it's kept below a 0.5% um, uh, um, solution, it hasn't been shown to be cytotoxic, but again, if it isn't mixed properly, it can actually be deleterious to osteoblasts and cytotoxic to the wound. So there is some you know, literature in the spine world and the uh, hip, arth and sorry, in the uh, arthroplasty world that dilute betadine may be uh, a reasonable option to use. Um, at the end of the case, we typically use topical vancomycin, again, another off-label practice. Uh, but is something that has certainly um, come on as the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so, and more and more uh, surgeons are using it, not just in the orthopedic world, uh, but elsewhere in the cardiothoracic world. But certainly if there's an instrumented case um, that uh, you just performed, it's, uh, again, relatively low risk, low cost, um, and, as, and there's a, a decent amount of data to show that it might be beneficial. Finally, you know, something as simple as post-operative dressings, uh, looking into that, um, a lot of the patients we do just at the shrine with the idiopathic scoliosis population, they're relatively low risk of infection. But the patients who are a little bit higher risk in the cerebral palsy population or in incisions that go down to the pelvis, uh, so they're getting close to the uh, um, inferior aspect of the spine, have a higher incidence of uh, uh, wound complications. And there is some good growing evidence to show that just leaving the dressing on for a period of longer than, than is typical can actually reduce infection. So, um, you know, something as simple as leaving an occlusive dressing on for at least five days post-op. You don't have to look at the wound. It was a sterile dressing that was put on in the operating room. You can keep it on there for up to five days. There's no reason to look at it unless there's any trouble with wound drainage. So just a couple little quick things we've done uh, that have helped us sort of reduce our infection rates here uh, at the shrine, but certainly just being aware of it and turning the lights on has been shown uh, to increase, sorry, to decrease uh, surgical site infections if you're just sort of aware of it. So, great. I'm gonna just really uh, briefly summarize what I heard. Number one being pre-op optimization of the patient, especially controllable factors to some extent like weight, glucose, smoking, et cetera. Number two was pre-op night before chlorhexidine scrub. Number three was intraoperative irrigation and doing it properly. Number four was topical vancomycin. And number five was post-op dressings and consider leaving them on uh, unless you really need to deal with a draining wound uh, soaking through the dressing, I guess, or something like that. Um, great. So how strong is the current evidence on topical antibiotics? You mentioned uh, topical vancomycin. Um, it's off label, um, but we have some evidence. How, how would you grade the evidence that's out there and what, what do we really know? That's a great question. I think the evidence out there is good, but not great, as is a lot of the evidence for orthopedics. Uh, a lot of retrospective studies, not many uh, randomized controlled studies, but I think you know it sort of began in the spine world with Fred Sweet's article back in 2011, where he looked at all of his patients uh, that he was not using it, and then started using it on all of his patients, and noted a significant reduction in postoperative surgical site infections uh, without any significant deleterious effect to the patient. Uh, they had a very low uh, uh, systemic uh, concentrations; it was undetectable in 80% of the patients, and of those, uh, their serum banco levels were were gone within three days. So. I think the you know choosing uh, topical antibiotics is certainly has a growing amount of uh, of data. Uh, specifically, looking at vancomycin again has been very attractive just because of the pharmacokinetics of it. It's a very large molecule, so that usually uh, tends to limit or prevent systemic absorption, which is what most folks are worried about with having these sort of low subtherapeutic systemic concentrations that may lend themselves to development of. Uh, uh, resistant, uh, resistant organisms, uh, if you have this sort of subtherapeutic concentration. Um, you know, there's some good animal literature to show that it's relatively safe, and again, to the surrounding tissues as well as to the uh, other organ systems. It's not necessarily cytotoxic to the kidneys that they found, again, because it really just stays in the wound and then goes away. Um, Unfortunately, though, again, in, in, the, in the literature is growing, it's, it's in the adult world, uh, uh, adult spine, adult uh, trauma, and even pediatric spine, it's been shown to be uh, relatively efficacious and safe uh, with minimal uh, side effects. The majority of them, though, are all pro, uh, retrospective studies. 
Uh, there's only, to my knowledge, one randomized controlled trial and spine study back from 2013, and it actually showed equivocal results with uh, versus control. The thing was that the one concern about that study is they, they were sort of in low risk populations to begin with. The infection rate in that study was only one and a half percent for both groups. So again, the infection rate already was pretty low. So was it adequately powered to really show any potential benefits? And that's sort of the trouble with the infection literature is given that most of the uh, um, surgeries we perform have a relatively low infection rate, the number you really need for these uh, adequately powered studies can be in the thousands. So um, the, one, the other concerns that are out there with vancomycin in the literature look at, uh, well, is there a potential higher incidence of gram-negative or polymicrobial infections that are coming out in these patients that receive vancomycin? And it's a bit, so some of these uh, studies have shown that uh, there's a higher incidence of polymicrobial infections or gram-negative infections after the use of vanco powder with a the theory that they're sort of, uh, you know, self-selecting or, or if the vanco is somehow bringing out these other infections, similar to, you know, uh, developing C. diff uh, after you've been getting antibiotics or something else because you're sort of killing the good gut flora and allowing the bad to, to flourish. I don't know that I necessarily understand how that works. There's only a couple papers out there that have put that out, but it is you know, something to be aware of. You certainly shouldn't have any pre-existing bacteria in your you know, back at all. So the fact that you're getting this sort of selective pressure towards gram-negative or polymicrobial infections doesn't necessarily make sense to me, but it is, it has, it is out there. Um, again, it is a, an off-label use. Um, so it's something that the CDC currently does not recommend. Uh, as it right on the bottle, it says for IV use only. Uh, but again, it does have a growing number of uh, um, uh, uh, sorry uh, studies out there in the literature that show that it it is looking it is demonstrating a significant reduction in surgical site infections. So I think it's it's one that should be given uh, some thought. It, again, is relatively low cost certainly compared to a surgical site infection. It's nominal. Vancomycin is about twenty bucks, but it is going to require some large scale randomized controlled studies, which will need to be done with in conjunction with the FDA and the CDC and just getting those off the ground is gonna be a challenge. Yeah, I think that's the, the hard thing. Not a lot of infections, so you need big studies. And um, you, know, the, you know, it is definitely a crossover topic. Uh, we've been using it in orthopedic trauma. Um, one of the larger uh, consortiums, the metric consortium uh, which comprises um, several orthopedic uh, sites across the U.S. did uh, complete a randomized control trial looking at vancomycin powder versus control um, in about a little over a thousand patients with tibia plateau and pilon fractures. So hoping to look at that group of patients that's probably, at least in our world, most likely to get infected. And it did show efficacy over control, uh, certainly for gram-positive deep infections. Um, but, uh, you know, that is just kind of our world of orthopedic trauma and doesn't really even cover everything. Um, so that said, what remain the biggest challenges in preventing infections currently? You know, despite what we have, you feel like, you know, we still have issues with. Right, I think it's always just going to be there, even in the, you know, the, uh, as I said, in my world with idiopathic scoliosis, which is relatively low, it's just, you can, even if with your uh, best laid intentions, you still may have trouble. I think that the issue is that it's just such a multifactorial problem uh, with infection prevention, starting from in the office, patient selection, you know, uh, getting the, how the patient's prepped before and during the procedure, uh, the types of you said, the types of drapes and gloves that you use in your practices in and out of the operating room. There's so many things that go into it. Uh, and just trying to find that uh, homogenous procedure and patient population that you can really study and just sort of only change one thing to really show, is it, you know, what is it that's giving you the, mo the biggest effect? I think, again, the thing that I've seen that's been really enlightening is, is as we spoke of before, was the Hawthorne effect that there's a lot of institutions now which are instituting these sort of protocols. And I think the more you can sort of standardize things and then have these sort of institutional report cards where everyone's a bit more aware of their own infection rates relative to everyone else in the institution, just by turning the lights on, people are a bit more aware of, of uh, uh, the, the problem and, and how they're doing relative to everyone else. So again, I think that's the challenge. It's just so multifactorial, but just looking at the problem, 
trying to develop some standardization protocols can really help uh, move the needle forward. Great, and um, I guess to follow up to that, and for the sake of time, probably be my last question. You know, given the current challenges we still have, uh, what are the research opportunities out there? Maybe things already being investigated, coming down the pike to help further our abilities uh, to be successful in uh, preventing infection. Yeah, I think there's some really cool stuff uh, out there. Again, with the topical antibiotics is, is uh, certainly a hot topic now. Um, looking at antibiotic coated instrumentation, if that's something that could be uh, really moved forward. I know that certainly could be a potential issue that if you, you know, if it's coated in the factory, then that implant then becomes a drug. So that needs to be regulated by the FDA. So, you know, uh, companies are looking at ways to potentially coat uh, instrumentation in the operating room by the surgeon. Uh, but you certainly need to be kind of a bit um, weary of that a little bit that if there's any uh, issue that it might have a sort of slow elution rate over time, you know, is, it, is that, will that potentiate resistance? But again, things to think about with, uh, you know, antibiotic impregnated uh, devices is something that's out there. I think the other cool thing I've seen is this sort of Teflon coating of implants. I know it's, it's out there in the uh, suture literature. They've, they've got some uh, means of uh, coating the suture material to try to inhibit or prevent the sort of biofilm or glycocalyx from forming on the uh, suture material. And they're now trying to look at doing that for implants. So just uh, to avoid the, uh, the bacteria from sticking to the, uh, the metal, I think would be uh, sort of the next uh, leap if they can, but we're, we're still a ways away from getting there. Interesting stuff, but uh, I think those are some good ideas out there uh, just beyond what we're already able to do. Um, that said, I mean, this still remains an issue. Uh, it's an important problem. Uh, it's an important topic. Uh, our topic today was infection after spine surgery and best practices to avoid it. I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Josh Pays from the Shriners Hospital for Children, Philadelphia. Josh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.